again to another program of Searching for Answers. My name is Carolyn Thompson and on my right is John Pauline, Dean of the School of Religion at Loma Linda University. And John Jones, La Sierra University School of Religion. John Brunt, the Azure Hills Church. Ivan Blazin, Loma Linda School of Religion. Well, as you can see, we have some very high-level theologians with us on tonight's program. I'll do my best, but I think I should really be quiet and let them do all the talking. Even though I have lots to say, I don't think they want to hear it. But we'll sure see. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, John Pauline, would you just kind of give us a little review of uh, what's going on with Jesus before Pilate and Herod and how the guards mocked Jesus? And they kind of pushed him around a little bit, too. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, was, uh, it was a pretty brutal situation. I think people today are, are largely familiar with these events uh, because they've been in the news and in the media in recent years. Uh, but uh, in particular, we're looking at Luke. And uh, what many people, many people, when they think of the Gospels, they think of a kind of Hollywood version. Yes. Whatever movie they have seen or perhaps a book they've read about right. the life of Jesus. But actually the Bible contains four different lives of Jesus and each one of them has a unique perspective and a unique approach. Now Luke in particular is, is one that we've been looking at and one of the unique facets of Luke that we just covered in the last session was that Luke is the only one that talks about Herod. Uh, in all the Gospels you have Jesus being brought, uh, first of all, to the high priest and then mm -hmm. to Pilate. And uh, that's basically the substance of it. But Luke has this unique perspective that he's also sent to Herod. And uh, Herod and Pilate have not been friends. They're in charge of rival territories and so yeah. forth. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, in this interchange, according to Luke, they do become friends over Jesus. So opposition to Jesus, I guess, can make friends as well as uh, uh, having a common faith yes. in Jesus. Perhaps the one thing just to remind uh, okay. those who've been following this program is simply that Luke in particular is the gospel for the outcast. Uh, Luke oh. has a burden for the, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, so on women, uh, Gentiles, uh, etc. And uh, as a result, uh, we want to be always watching to say, you know, what is Luke's unique point of view here? How is he bringing that perspective out in this story? Yeah. And of course, before Pilate, you get a charge or charges, which really and truly, as we have read all of the, this gospel, do not add up. They're false charges. I mean, when you read here in verse, you know, uh, starting with 20, chapter 23, verse 1, then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man perverting our nation. Now, what was the perverting our nation? Forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we know that Jesus had answered, you know, give to Caesar what's his and That's to God right. what's God's. So it was a trumped up charge that was not true. Right. It reminds me of the current uh, political campaign. <laughs> I was looking at one program which was comparing uh, the ads <laughs> that both uh, the presidential candidates are making. And uh, each one of them alters the details of what really is mm -hmm. so as to make their point. So that's what's uh, going on it's here. It's going on here. Yes. And of course they said beside that, you know, he makes himself the Messiah a king. Of course, that's what they were looking for. If, if one would only come up and be the one they were expecting, then they would be very happy. 
But, you know, they had asked him whether he was the Messiah, you know, and he says, uh, I think... Uh, I think they said, uh, Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Yeah. And he said, yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Well, is that, is it, what version is that that you've got? And what verse New is that? Ver, that was verse 3? Right. NIV. See, isn't it interesting, in, in the New Revised Center, he answered, you say so. He doesn't give an unequivocal yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, well, mm -hmm. that's what your, yeah. these are your words. This is your idea. Mm -hmm. He's not necessarily yeah. accepting mm -hmm. it. Isn't it interesting? Jesus fits every box that people want to put him in and yet doesn't fit any of them finally. He, he, he pushes the envelope no matter who is trying to put him in one. There is uh, an astonishing kind of accommodation, which I think is part of the incarnation on the one hand, and which allowed the gospel to go to many different cultures because there were many takes on Jesus after his earthly ministry. And yet, at the same time, nothing quite defines him. He overspills the edges, doesn't he, of whatever box people want to put him in. That's right. That's well, right. I might add also that if you have your Bibles, please go to the book of Luke. It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going through the book of Luke, and we have been for several weeks now. And it's chapter 23, and it's right at the beginning of the chapter, uh, where chapter 4, then, I mean, verse 4, then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Yeah. But they insisted. John Brunt, what did they say? accused Jesus of doing in verse 5 of chapter 23? Well, maybe we should read it. But okay. they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod. So the people say he stirred things up down here. He was really a Galilean, but he came down here uh, Remember back in the civil rights movement, they accused people of being outside agitators. Mm. That became a, a phrase uh, mm. to put down the people who were uh, trying to uh, raise certain issues. And that's kind of what they're saying here. This guy's an outside agitator. He started in Galilee, and now he's come down here to and Jerusalem. And so what he says, you mean he's, he's from Galilee? Yeah. Well, so says, a Galilean, yeah. huh? So what did he mm -hmm. say? Where did he send him? He's, he sends him to Herod. Oh, was, and uh, Herod, did he say, oh, I don't want to get involved in here. No, Herod it? seems no? to kind of look forward to the yeah, opportunity. That's He's heard I'm... about this guy, uh -huh. and so he says, ah, oh, I'd like to, like to have a crack at uh, finding out a okay. little bit about him. So he sends him to Jesus, and, uh, you know, right so, away Herod says, do a miracle for me. Yeah, maybe we should read that section. Yeah, Let yeah. me just throw in something here. <laughs> yeah, read he that stirs section. up the people. Yeah. yeah. Stirs up the people. Mm -hmm. That that gets a note out that is very important. Yeah. If there's anything the Romans wouldn't want, is for the people to be stirred up by someone's teaching, like for example that uh, maybe a messianic claim of some kind, you know, a king. So that would be a very bad uh, uh, look at Jesus. He mm -hmm. stirs them up. Rome's yeah. ire could raise after that. Oh, yeah. That was a, they knew how to... That's in verse... Uh, five. Actually, verse 2 already, but... Uh, yeah, it's already we're in two. verse 5. There, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. just both, both cases. Okay, uh, the so fact then of the matter is, this is not a simple exchange. The people don't just come back and say once, well, he's stirring up. No. The original here says that he kept on... says that they kept on insisting over and over. They wouldn't turn it loose. And that's how, why uh, finally Pilate is exasperated with the whole thing, I think. Yeah. Why does he answer to, uh, talk to Pilate but not to Herod? We can speculate. We don't know. But the fact of the matter is that Herod Antipas, uh, who knew the Jewish ways... Because he was uh, half Jewish. Has, well, his father was. Yes. His uh, uncle was. But, uh, yes, he had Jewish blood and was a pretender. I mean, he... he positioned himself as one of them. He knew the law. He knew the, the, the customs. Uh, Jesus doesn't need to answer him anything. You know? 
Pilate is different. Pilate is an outsider, and Jesus is at least willing to try to engage at some mm -hmm. level, isn't he? Mm -hmm. We can we can go on and see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Shall we read about yeah, Herod? Yeah, why don't you do okay. that? Okay. Uh -huh. um, verse 8. This is uh, Luke okay. 23, verse 8. Good. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Yes, that's something. So uh, Herod is hoping to see a miracle. Yeah. Yep. And of course, Jesus yeah. knows that miracles do not convince the unconverted heart. Uh, miracles, so many times through Jesus' ministry, only wanted people to see more, you know? We saw what you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do mm. for us today, you know? If, if people mm. are just looking for the spectacular, looking for the miracle, they aren't looking for the issues of what Jesus right. is really trying to say about his kingdom. And isn't that Jesus the, knows this. Isn't that the uh, point of the story of the rich man and Lazarus? That even mm -hmm. if someone came back from the dead, even if someone came back from the dead, they wouldn't be convinced, you see. Mm -hmm. Unless they believe the law and the prophets, the testimony of the law and the prophets, then they're not going to believe even if someone came back from the dead. More, more than interesting, that comment, isn't it? Okay, so we sent him back to Pilate. John, Pauline, mm -hmm. what did Pilate say when he came back? And they were no longer enemies. He was no longer, he and Herod were no longer enemies. And so Jesus came back to Pilate. Mm -hmm. So what happened after that? Well, I think one of, the, one of the possibilities, and with the Gospels, you're always reading between the lines, yeah. trying to go behind the scenes. But one of the, one of the popular possibilities for this book is that Luke and Acts were actually written as a deposition for Paul's trial in Rome, because the uh, book of Acts kind of ends there. Yeah. that Paul is awaiting his trial. And some feel like the way this is written, it's written as a deposition for that. In other words, to, uh, to give the emperor and, and his colleagues there some sense of the story of Jesus that Paul is proclaiming everywhere, and to get somehow a sense this is not a threat to the empire. And so I think if that's the case, it's very important at this point that Pilate comes along and he says, look, I've examined him, in your presence, find no basis for your charge, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Neither is Herod. He has sent him back to us. As you can see, he's done nothing deserving of death. Mm -hmm. So here you have the two top Roman officials in the province. Mm -hmm. Both of them interviewed Jesus. Neither of them finds anything wrong, you see. Now, if it were that this was written with the Roman government in mind, I think this would be powerful that Luke would take it this way and emphasize the Herod, you know, that may be why Herod is here, simply because it adds another witness yes. mm -hmm. to the whole idea. Jesus is innocent. He was unjustly uh, put to death. And of course, uh, if the story were known that uh, Pilate was disgraced uh, sometime after this and ended up uh, dying a rather ignominious death himself, uh, the Roman authorities would say, okay, the bad guy here maybe was, was one of our guys, and we know that he was a bad guy. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, those people who are following Jesus are not crazy people. They're saying, hey, an injustice was done here, but uh, God has used that injustice to bring good <coughs> to us. Okay. Well, Luke is sometimes called an apologist. And the reason is he keeps saying, I mean, in the account in, in the gospel and then in the book of Acts, he keeps on saying over and over again, innocent. Mm -hmm. Innocent. Mm -hmm. Innocent. That's what lends <laughs> exactly. some cred credibility to what you're saying, John. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting that Pilate, according to Luke, is so definite in saying that Jesus is innocent, yeah. but then his response to the people after saying he's innocent is, well, 
I'll have him punished mm -hmm. and then release him. A little so, sap. Yeah. That's not the way so, we treat innocent people, hopefully. No. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> so, well, I, I was, I would, he just was giving in to the people, the Jewish people. But right. only part. And, part way. and yeah. he was giving in part way to them. He says, I'll have him whipped and we'll, we'll let him loose. But don't you think people start to see that if you're willing to give a little bit, yeah. you'll probably Push. give more if you're pressured enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, uh, you know, if you are absolutely unbending in your integrity, <laughs> why people will get that idea. But if you're willing to say, well, okay, we'll bend it a little. Trying well, to please the not? crowd. Yeah. yeah, why not a little more? Why not a little more? Yeah. If we press hard yeah. enough. Yeah. Following up on what Ivan said, it, it occurred to me, and I found it here in verse 47 of the same chapter, the centurion, seeing what had happened, this is at the cross, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man or an innocent, innocent man. man. Now, now right. the centurion is described as saying in other gospels, this, surely this was the Son of God, God. Mm -hmm. you yeah. see. So for Luke, <laughs> this idea of his legal innocence is extremely important. Yeah. Whatever else you make of, uh, of, of this turn of events, uh, he, he seems to be trying to convince somebody uh, that uh, Jesus was not legally guilty in this yeah. trial. Really, okay, truly. shall we read on down? Let's go ahead and read. Um, yeah, bring some continuity here. We're kind of skipping around. Uh, verse 18 of chapter 23. Uh, after Pilate says, he doesn't deserve, therefore I will punish him and then release him. Verse 18, with one voice they cried out, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Now Barabbas was a naughty person. He caused insurrection and he was a murderer. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third, third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insisted, demand, insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Okay, John Jones, would you start with the crucifixion which is verse 26 yes and here we move into the crucifixion scene itself and it's hard reading still mm -hmm. 2,000 years later mm -hmm. when we understand the horror <laughs> of what's involved here it makes me depressed when I read well, this well it mm -hmm. is a heart rending thing the interesting write off is the fact mm -hmm. that the subject of the action here now becomes rather ambiguous it is they whoever they is and Luke doesn't I think doesn't want to be too specific right mm -hmm. here, right now. So, picking up with verse 26, and, and this happens to be the New American Standard uh, Version this evening. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. Probably one of those people who was just coming for the Passover from uh, upland, out, mm -hmm. out, uh, mm -hmm. further out. And following him was a large crowd of the people and of women, mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep rather for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the womb that never bore, and the breast that never nursed. And then they began to say to the mountain, and they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us, mm. an apocalyptic uh, mm -hmm. foretaste. For verse 31, for if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? Okay, when I read that verse, when I've been studying, I didn't know what it meant. Mm. Do you folks know what it is, Ivan? Do you understand that verse? Well, when the wood is green, that's when it's, <clears throat> first it's got all that life, life blood, so to speak, flowing through it, right? 
So is that a reference then to um, Jesus if they do this with the life flowing um, teaching of Jesus and presence of Jesus? Then what happens after he dies? Now that's one way to look at it. I'm mm -hmm. sure there are probably mm -hmm. other ways to look at it. Did too. anybody <laughs> happen to look up Ezekiel 20 verse 47 and see what it says? Well, that does relate to the point that the, the dr dry and green trees yes. that uh, in the Old Testament, the tree is a symbol of God's people. And a green tree would be a flourishing, healthy people. But when the people become unfaithful to God, they're portrayed as a dry tree. And, and this, right? this text, this text combines that too. Now, oh. uh, I want to share with you later uh, after Can you John's read, read that, these, John? what some scholars have said about this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, just picking up the beginning of the sentence, we can, uh, a couple of short verses. Picking up with verse 45 then. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Teman and speak out against the south and prophesy against the forest land of the Negev. So now begins the prophecy. Say to the forest of the Negev, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm about to kindle a fire in you, or among you, we might read it, um, and it will consume every green tree in you as well as every dry tree. The blazing flame will not be quenched, and the whole surface from south to north will be burned by it. So now it's not only the dry, but even the green, the prophecy. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, related when the Babylonians came. They didn't make a distinction between the faithful yeah. and the unfaithful. Yeah. Everybody suffered together. Yeah. The nation as a whole, being unrepentant, uh, ended up in exile. But there were faithful people like Daniel and his three friends uh, who are taken out as well. Now, uh, applying that to Luke 23, uh, David Owney, who's uh, a very highly respected scholar at uh, Notre Dame University, he he looks at this thing, he sees Jesus as being the green tree, but the dry tree is the people who uh, would face the destruction of Jerusalem, yeah, which he talks about that. in chapter mm -hmm. 21. And so Jesus is saying, look, if the Romans can act like this Toward to me. an innocent man, mm -hmm. to a faithful man, what's going to happen when the unfaithful nation is brought into judgment. So yeah. he's seeing, he's tying double. Uh, what happens to Jesus to uh, what happens is to the people. Is it kind of a parable? In a sense, yeah. The, uh, that Jesus, you could say it's an acted parable that Jesus experiences what the whole people experience. Okay. And of course we know that uh, Luke doesn't do the theology here. No. Uh, there's very little theology in, in this gospel. But uh, we do know that in a sense Jesus does take the consequence of sin mm -hmm. for us on the cross. Uh, I think it's Peter that says uh, that uh, he, he carried our sins in his body on the tree. Mm -hmm. So in a real sense, Jesus does act out the experience of the lost okay. on his way to the cross. Yeah. Very good. And you know that in John, the fr fruitless tree, the fruitless vine, mm -hmm. uh, what happens to them? They burn, mm -hmm. they burn. And that's really what's happening mm -hmm. here. In so far as this applies to the people, then uh, what's going to happen? Jesus will no longer be there, and, and of course we know what happened. Mm -hmm. Ivan, would you read uh, verse 32? 32. May Check. I just mention one thing sure. before we do that? Um, verse 26, it's interesting okay. that here in Luke, Simon of Cyrene is just a, 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 a side comment almost. They yeah. found this passerby. <laughs> Simon of Cyrene, who carried it's the cross. It's kind of in the wrong place, too. Well, Whoever. But in, yeah, in Mark, it's interesting that he mentioned, Mark mentions yeah, he does. that he is the father of two people, Alexander oh, and Rufus. Oh, that's right. And, you know, if, if Mark mentions that he's these guys' father, that would seem to imply that the readers of Mark must have known mm -hmm. these sons of oh, Simon of Cyrene. Yes. Why would you say, by the way, he's Alexander and Rufus' father, oh, if you didn't know who they were? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that would seem to suggest that maybe as a result of carrying the cross, this family became Christians oh, later on. I yeah. see. Yeah. Interesting. Very good. Okay, and Luke Ivan. Luke apparently didn't know that family history. He, mm -hmm. he may not have been acquainted with any of them, and so it doesn't, well, mm. doesn't become 
It's interesting if scholarship is correct that Mark lays behind the Gospel of Luke writing that he doesn't make something of it. But, yeah. you know, not every point is equally yeah, that's right. pertinent. That's right. Well, yeah. shall I read with verse 32 on? Please. Uh -huh. Two others who also were criminals, uh, who, that is, excuse me, two others also who were criminals mm -hmm. were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. You want me to keep going? Or Please, stop? we've got a little over a minute. Okay, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. Okay, John Jones, would you continue reading to the, uh, down to verse 44, please? Well, all right, this is 39 now, picking up. One of, <coughs> one of the criminals who was hanged there was hurling abuse at him and saying, Are you not the Messiah, the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? We are indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we, res we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. There's another one of those testimonies, mm -hmm. John. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Very interesting verse. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, people trying to uh, say, well, this verse has got the comma in the wrong place and a few other things. So I think in our next segment, we're going to uh, examine this verse. And with all the scholars I have with me, I'm going to find out the answer for all of you out in <laughs> television land. So yes. in the meantime, this is Carolyn Thompson saying, Again, join us next time as we keep searching for those answers.